The pathophysiology of subclavian steel syndrome is atherosclerosis, specifically at the proximal subclavian artery. Additionally, in select cases, subclavian steel syndrome may also follow repair of an aortic coarctation. We have here a schematic demonstrated subclavian steel syndrome and its underlying pathophysiology. As we can see here on this patient's left-hand side, we can see that they have a stenosis involving the proximal subclavian artery. Therefore, if this patient were to exert their arm on this side, there's going to be a lack of blood flow sufficient to keep up with this exertion and increase in activity, thus resulting in pain or claudication. And therefore, understanding the location here at this proximal subclavian artery is extremely high yield to keep in mind for our patients with subclavian steel syndrome. In addition, because there is insufficient blood flow to this affected side, there's going to be a decrease in the blood pressure on this side compared to our healthy or unaffected side. And this is also something that frequently shows up on examinations, is this difference between the two arms when we measure the blood pressure going through that brachial artery. Consistent with this, on physical exam, patients with subclavian steel syndrome are classically going to have a 15 millimeter mercury difference between their two arms, as the arm on the affected side is going to have a lower measured blood pressure. Additionally, in these patients, we should perform a duplex ultrasound, as well as in some cases an MRA or CTA, in order to get visualization of the affected blood vessels, which in this case is going to be the proximal subclavian artery. Our management in these patients is ultimately going to be revascularization, and this can be performed by either surgery or with the use of a stent or bypass. Moving on to carotid stenosis, our classic patient for this condition is going to be an older male smoker who presents with a transient ischemic attack, or a TIA. The underlying pathophysiology in this case is an atherosclerotic plaque, particularly that occurs at the carotid bifurcation, and we can appreciate the location of this plaque in our schematic on the right-hand side of the presentation. Or we can clearly see here that if this bottom portion here represents the common carotid, and here we have the external carotid as well as the internal carotid, and ultimately there is going to be a hindrance here in terms of blood flow to the brain. In addition to this, because we have this atherosclerotic plaque that is simply hanging out here, this can ultimately break off and embolize to the brain, thus resulting in a TIA or stroke. There's some classic findings that you may see on fundoscopy when these emboli ultimately go to the brain in a patient with carotid artery stenosis. These include, in the case of our patients who develop central retinal artery occlusions, that we can classically see this cherry red macula. One other finding that we may see as this plaque ultimately embolizes to the brain and to the retinal vasculature is that we can also see what are known as Holland horse plaques. These can be appreciated in the fundoscopic image on the right, where we can clearly see these tiny plaques in our retinal vessels. And therefore, being aware of both of these potential findings, both the cherry red macula as well as our Holland horse plaques, are especially high yield for examinations. On physical exam, our patients with carotid stenosis are classically going to have a brewery at that location. Additionally, we should perform a duplex ultrasound in these patients, and in some cases may also get an MRA or a CTA in order to evaluate this vasculature of the head and neck. Because these patients may present with TIAs or strokes, we will often also perform an echo in order to rule out potential heart disease as a contributor. In the following slides, we are going to go into more detail in terms of the exact cutoffs in male and female patients. However, overall, a couple of key rules to keep in mind in general or that if we have a patient with a 70 to 99% stenosis of that carotid artery, and that patient is symptomatic, then we should ultimately perform a carotid end arterectomy. In this procedure, we essentially open up the patient's carotid artery and remove the plaque that is causing their symptoms. However, for patients who have 100% stenosis of the carotid artery, or if they have a life expectancy that is less than five years, then we really want to avoid performing this high-risk procedure of the carotid end arterectomy. In these patients, we are going to provide antiplatelet therapy, including aspirin or clopidogrel, as well as a statin and lifestyle modifications, such as smoking and cessation. The reason, of course, that we do not perform these endarterectomies in all patients is because there are some important risks for us to be aware of. The most important of these are, first of all, stroke, as when we perform the endarterectomy, sometimes the plaque can ultimately embolize during the procedure and go to the brain. This occurs in about 1% of cases. Additionally, these patients are at risk for injury to the hypoglossal nerve, which crosses in front of the carotid artery. Just to make these points more clear, we have a schematic here of what we perform during a carotid endarterectomy. As we can see, during the surgical procedure, we quite literally make an incision in the artery, and then quite literally, with our surgical tools, we are able to remove the plaque that is causing the patient's symptoms. However, in select cases, as we are removing this plaque, some of the plaque can break off and ultimately go up to the brain, thus resulting in a stroke during the surgical procedure. And this is why we only perform carotid endarterectomies in select cases. As we described previously, there is also a risk here of damage to the hypoglossal nerve. This is because, as we can appreciate in the schematic in the center of our screen, we have here this carotid artery, which is running down this way, and the hypoglossal nerve, which essentially crosses directly in front of that. Therefore, it is not hard for us to imagine that this hypoglossal nerve can get nicked during the procedure, thus resulting in loss of cranial nerve 12 function. And therefore, in addition to the risk of stroke that we have during carotid endarterectomies, we must also be aware of this important risk as well.
Therefore, the real key as we get into more detail here in terms of exactly what we're going to do in terms of management for our patients with carotid stenosis is that we have either an endarterectomy or medical management, and we must decide between those two pathways. When we say medical management, we're referring to antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel, the use of a statin, as well as lifestyle modification, including smoking cessation. In our previous slides, we had already mentioned some general scenarios that we should be aware of for examination purposes, namely that if the patient has a 100% occlusion, then they should ultimately receive medical therapy in the case of symptomatic patients. Additionally, for our symptomatic patients with a 70 to 99% occlusion, those patients should ultimately receive an endarterectomy. When we get to lower levels of the percent of carotid stenosis with which we are dealing, the management actually differs depending on whether the patient is male or female. In the case of our males who have 50 to 69% stenosis and are symptomatic, those patients should ultimately get an endarterectomy. However, for our female patients who are symptomatic with the same level of carotid stenosis, 50 to 69%, these female patients should receive our medical therapy regimen. In contrast, for our patients who are asymptomatic and have carotid stenosis, if they have at least an 80% stenosis, then ultimately we should proceed with our endarterectomy procedure. However, those who are asymptomatic and have less than 80% occlusion are ultimately generally not going to be candidates for surgery. And therefore, if we can understand these cutoffs, including this distinction here between our management of males and females depending on their level of carotid stenosis, then you will be in excellent shape for your examinations. Additionally, because the guidelines for endarterectomy cutoffs have changed in recent years and will likely continue to change, if you see a discrepancy between our cutoffs here and any other literature, please, please, please drop a comment below or feel free to email us at any time as we strive to have 100% accuracy and to give you the most high-yield information possible.